It was a beautiful day. This is April 19th. You can see the countdown clock. Endeavor was in great shape, sitting there on the pad, very clear blue skies in the background. You would think that you may be nervous on a day that you're going to climb atop six million pounds of rocket fuel that uh, may not go the way you want, but uh, particularly when we'd gotten up in the morning and we didn't launch until the afternoon. But you can tell from looking at the crew here, uh, we are not nervous, and I've never understood why. Uh, the first time I launched in the afternoon, I thought I might be. John may look a little nervous, but he's not right here. <laughs> He is just pumping up his suit, and then you can see Scott is definitely not nervous. He's uh, doing well, getting ready to go. It is a pretty exciting time. We're getting in our suits, obviously going through the final checks, and uh, we've been trained so well. I think it's a real testament to training that we're ready to go, and for whatever reason, there just is not the apprehension. Well, here we are walking out to the uh, vehicle that takes us out to the launch pad. And believe it or not, we rehearsed this walkout. And booster ignition and liftoff of the special endeavor that's in each of the space station partnerships At this point, we're rocking and rolling. The, the shuttle solid booster rockets are firing, and there's a fair amount of shake going on. That continues for about two minutes until the booster rockets separate with a, with a bang and a flash that you'll see right there. And now the space shuttle main engines continue to carry us uphill for about another six and a half minutes, and the ride gets a lot smoother. There the booster rockets are falling away to be used again. When the main engines flame out, the, we fly formation on the external tank, which Chris is about to snap pictures of. We fly formation on it for a while, and then we fly our orbiter, fire our orbiter maneuvering, ro maneuvering rockets to get us into a stable orbit. Then we open the payload bay doors and do a massive reconfiguration to turn our trusty rocket ship into a spaceship ready for orbit operations. This star you're looking at now is brilliant and becoming more brilliant all the time. That is the space station, and that's what it looked like to us during the rendezvous. You'll notice the flashing out the windows, and those of our the jets that we're firing, do a, we do a number of those during the rendezvous to make sure we can put the shuttle, as you see it closing down the station in the right portion of the sky. They, uh, I tell you what, the station is very intimidating. It is so large that the, even when we're 1,000 feet away, you feel like ducking that you're going to hit it. You can see our payload bay that Chris described earlier here with the shuttle. This shot was taken from the expedition crew as we're closing up. And I'm sure it's a little bit scary from their vantage point as well with this big space shuttle, a quarter million pounds of approaching from below. The, uh, we're lined up now with the uh, docking module closing on in. This is a target we use, and we make sure it's centered and all the alignments are flown out so that we have a successful docking. Here comes the docking. Station is coming from above. And watch the dynamics. At 17,000 miles an hour, although that was at 0.1 feet per second, uh, there are some dynamics between the two. You saw this photo earlier. We're very excited to be there, and we were uh, dying to get the hatch open. Well, uh, as was mentioned earlier, this was the most complex robotics flight in the history of the shuttle program. And it began the day after uh, docking with uh, the first of several uh, difficult maneuvers. Uh, seen here is the uh, shuttle robotic arm, which is like a big crane. And I'm operating it, and I've uh, grappled and lifted the cradle containing the space station arm uh, out of the payload bay. Uh, as I lifted it out, it was just a magnificent sight passing over Baja, California. I twisted it and brought it forward, uh, overhead the shuttle cockpit into a position where we could temporarily install it on the International Space Station. While Jeff was doing all the good uh, arm work, uh, Scott and I were downstairs getting dressed. You put them on the same as at home. You put on your pants, you put on your shoes put on your jacket, and uh, then here's in the airlock with John and Yuri helping Scott and myself get into the final stages of the spacesuits, gloves, helmets, you can see our Snoopy caps, everything getting ready to depressurize and head outside. And it is like a chick coming out of an egg there as you uh, open up the hatch and poke your way out and look at the world below. Uh, the two of us uh, getting everything ready and starting to climb up on board Alpha, on board the International Station.
to assemble the arm. Lower right is Scott uh, installing that UHF antenna that Umberto mentioned. I'm riding the other arm, pulling up out of the way, and watch Scott here in the lower right. Nice mechanism built, uh, built in a couple different places around the states to give the station space-to-space uh, -space comm capability. And then it was time to bring the arm to life. I'm remo removing a bunch of blankets that kept it warm uh, while it was unpowered. And uh, then if you look in the lower right, Scott's driving a huge power drill uh, called a pistol grip tool. I'm riding on the other arm. And the purpose is to release the huge bolts that held the arm during launch. We call them super bolts. They were about three feet long. They were about three feet long, sort of like arrows. And uh, so we put them over in that thing below my chest over there called the quiver, putting the super bolts away one by one. Well, if you've ever dreamt about what it would be like to do a spacewalk, this is it. This is actually what I saw at the end of the uh, Space Lab pallet as I was about to lift up the, the booms of the space station robotic arm. This, uh, it took a uh, considerable amount of force. Here's a different view of it. I'm on the left, and Chris is free-floating on the right. It weighs about 140 pounds of force uh, required to pop that up, and you can see it's a massive structure. It's 60 feet from end effector to end effector on the arm and weighs about 3,000 pounds. You're going to see Chris uh, back on the robotic arm, the shuttle's arm, with uh, Jeff driving it, and we're going to unfurl the arm at uh, uh, the midway point, and you can see it's just a, uh, a huge uh, structure. And then we have uh, another view of uh, Chris at the end of the arm and a very rare view of our own orbiter, there's the uh, nose of the, uh, the shuttle Endeavour from his vantage point. We then had to insert uh, eight very special bolts that we called expandable diameter fastener uh, bolts. And these things uh, required a considerable amount of force. Uh, we used the uh, pistol grip tool that uh, Chris talked about earlier. Uh, used those and found that they weren't quite enough uh, to actually uh, rigidize the arm in place. So then we had to use uh, uh, brute strength and manually ratchet them. Here's uh, Chris's uh, pistol grip tool. You can see it kicks back a little bit. In the lower left, you can see me actually manually ratcheting those bolts tight. And uh, this is one of my favorite shots. It's a picture of uh, Susan looking out of the fishbowl or maybe us looking back in, but a uh, rare view of uh, uh, folks on either end of the, uh, the lab. Thanks. Well, after the, uh, the first spacewalk was behind us successfully, we got to ingress on station. We'd been there for two days, and it's really exciting. I've been to the space station before a couple years ago, but there's a whole new dimension when you get an ingress with three of your friends that have been there for uh, six weeks. And it's actually somewhat of an emotional uh, happening, and you'll get the flavor for that. But the, uh, it really is a great, a great time and a, a great part. Uh, it was really great for us to be part of the uh, expedition crew as we came on board. The, uh, here is Yuri. He, he recently had Doctor Station himself. They relocated the Soyuz the week before we got there, and he's pointing that out to us with his model. Here's uh, Jim Voss and Susan at the robotic workstation who have been doing a fantastic job along with Yuri up on the, uh, the station. We could not have been more impressed. Well, after, after four days of being on the shuttle, we were more than ready to go into the bright, airy uh, station where you can fly like Superman. And we're going to follow Scott now as he takes us on a tour of the space station. At, lower, at the left of the screen, you can see a yellow dot that guides you. We're now entering the American Laboratory, or Destiny Module, which, as you can see, is just jam-packed with scientific apparatus. From there, we go into the American Node, or Unity Module, which has six huge hatches which connect various pressurized elements. And there's Chris at work. And we're going to follow um, Scott through the next wall. And you're now leaving the American sector. We're entering the uh, Russian FGB or Zarya module. The module wheel in the American uh, modules. And it really brings back the heritage, the long heritage of Russian space station flying. This was the first module of the space station. It's now used mostly for storage. And behind these walls are cupboards, basically, and it looks like a long square tunnel with carpeted walls. Then we move through another um, 
sort of an airlock type module into the last major pressurized element um, on this long string, and that's the service module or Zvezda module. You'll see uh, Yuri and Yuri there talking pilot talk with their hands and talking about how, how nice the launch was. And then as we pass them, <laughs> we, we move into the, the kitchen of the service module. Um, and there's the kitchen table on the left. Jim Voss and Yuri have staterooms on the right and left where Susan has her stateroom in the, in the laboratory. And then finally, we move into the lifeboat of the station or the uh, Soyuz uh, entry vehicle. Raffaello, in the Endeavour cargo bay, we remove the umbilical providing power and uh, in preparation to lift uh, MPLM uh, up. Uh, moving uh, these 20,000 pounds uh, it was uh, quite a challenge and uh, Scott and I uh, were uh, maneuvering the, uh, the robotic arm. Uh, when uh, the um, MPLM was uh, close to the station then we latched with 16 motorized uh, bolts and this is the inside while we are doing uh, unloading operation. We like to call this uh, controller chaos. Uh, while we are uh, uh, trying to stow all the items uh, that we are returning to the ground. We transfer also experiments and this is one that we transfer from the mid deck of this uh, endeavor to the U.S. lab, uh, our uh, laboratory space. With Susan and uh, Jim flying, this is where you operate the arm from and this is the very first move of the space station arm, the Canada Arm 2. Uh, lifting the first of its huge joints up and out of the pallet that, that brought it up um, with uh, Jim and Susan. You fly it purely looking at the uh, camera views inside and reaching around the side of the lab and over top of the shuttle uh, to grab onto the side of Destiny to make it permanently part of the space station. Well, our work outside wasn't done. We went out for another uh, EVA on the sixth flight day and we're getting set up to basically uh, reconfigure all the power so that the new Canada Arm 2 could live and work on the space station for the next uh, 10 or more years. Uh, John and Bones were uh, in that flight deck of the orbiter uh, keeping us uh, on the timeline and driving the arm. And this is a neat shot of actually mating some of the power connectors that uh, we use to power the arm. You can see that uh, it's actually fairly challenging work. We're wearing a very thick pressurized uh, glove I'd liken it to trying to do brain surgery wearing a, a hockey mitt or a, a baseball glove. It's uh, uh, definitely very different than working in your own workshop. Some of the connectors were very fragile. We had to be very, very careful because uh, they were made of fiber optic material, so we had to go very slowly and, and uh, be deliberate. I don't think there are words in the English language that can describe the view. Uh, we certainly tried during our AVA, but uh, here's a neat view from Chris's vantage point up on the node looking down the whole stack about 200 feet towards the uh, Endeavour shuttle. We had one other major task which was to deliver a spare electronics unit. You can see Chris in the background there. And I had a beautiful ride on the end of the arm with, uh, with Jeff, uh, with Jeff uh, at the wheel of the arm. And uh, just a, a, a unique vantage point to see this from. On my left you can see Chris and his uh, maple leaf on the, on the left side of his suit and we uh, click this uh, new avionics unit onto the side of the lab. And like good tourists anywhere, uh, Chris takes a couple of pictures for us here, some happy snappies, and then we uh, take our last uh, good look at planet Earth, and it was time to call it uh, a day after about 15 hours of spacewalking on this mission. Mission accomplished, and as you can see in the next scene here, we have an empty payload bay. Uh, right now, you are looking at our great commander, control manager, uh, gliding through the lab. And uh, uh, and now we are in MPLM, where crew members uh, had a fun opportunity to exercise in zero gravity in their free time. As uh, you can see from this video, uh, we achieved pretty good results. <laughs> <laughs> The second spacewalk had powered up uh, Canada Arm 2, and so it was uh, now uh, ready to hand off the pallet. 
We've done a lot of work with the folks on the ground to uh, get a good configuration. And I reached up with the shuttle arm and uh, grabbed a hold of the right-hand side, and then the station arm backed away, a, a kind of, for Canada, a very historic handoff from the old arm uh, and the new arm together. After good teamwork, uh, it was time uh, to say goodbye. Um, it felt sad uh, to leave the station. Here comes the moment of closure of the hatch, and we said, see you guys on the ground. Well, after eight days docked to these, this beautiful space station, it was time to leave. We do that by releasing some hooks that uh, separate us and uh, were pushed away very gently by some big springs in this mechanism. And uh, we glide away at about a tenth of a foot per second. Uh, we fire our thrusters, uh, very small thrusters, and increase that rate a little bit. But it's a very smooth and slow, very graceful movement away from the space station. And I can tell you at this moment, uh, I was both very sad at leaving and also very proud to see this picture and the completion of our uh, critical mission. We uh, undocked over the Pacific, and uh, about uh, 10 minutes later, I looked down at maybe 100 feet out, and we were gliding over the Colorado Rockies, uh, where I grew up, a very neat experience. We continued then uh, up over the continental United States, up over Canada, which was very fitting uh, that we uh, pass over that great country as we depart. And I have to tell you, I, I looked at this and there was a little bit of a conflict in my head as my brain said, this is not possible, but my eyes were seeing it. And I can tell you that uh, it's really there. After uh, 13 days in space, uh, it's time uh, to come home. And, but first, we have to reconfigure the uh, orbiter uh, to, from, from a space ship to, to an airplane to land uh, safely on, on a runway. So we are, Jeff and I, uh, we are closing the payload bay door in preparation for entry. Um, actually, during the preparation, uh, there is a lot of work to do. First of all, uh, donning the uh, launch and entry suit, uh, um, and uh, here you see Jeff uh, in his uh, last attempt to take advantage of the zero G. <laughs> 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 and Commander Robel and, and Jeff uh, are uh, ready to start the engine firing for our deorbit, and at this time uh, we start uh, free falling uh, uh, to the ground, and when we start eating the atmosphere, you see all the uh, uh, results on the eating of the space shuttle against the uh, atmosphere. Um, at this point, uh, we are still going um, pretty fast, uh, and uh, uh, as soon as we start uh, decelerating, we start feeling the effect of the uh, weight again. Well, the good news was the uh, weather was g gorgeous at Edwards Air Force Base. Uh, bad news was it wasn't so good in Florida, so we made the right decision. Or the right decision was made on the ground, and we came around. Uh, down here, you see the lake bed, which is kind of fitting because 20 years and two weeks before we landed, the very first space shuttle with John Young and uh, Bob Crippen landed on that lake bed. We're coming down a, a steep glide path at 20 degrees, 300 knots. I was very proud of my pilot. You can see here he got the gear out at 400 feet above the ground. And here's a view again out the front window coming to this huge, beautiful runway. The, uh, we use the, the ball, the light on the left to help track down. That truck's not exactly where you think it is. It wasn't on the runway. <laughs> Touched down at 195 knots where you got the shoot out again right away. Again, uh, Bones did a great job. And uh, we come kind of crashing down on the nose gear at this point and roll to a stop. And you saw the star, the twinkle there on the, uh, the glass. And I think definitely somebody was watching us throughout this mission because uh, it was 100% su successful. Thanks uh, very much in part to the uh, folks on the ground. <laughs>